Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session today on building resilience in a changing climate, integrated water resource management for urban areas and food security. I'm very pleased that you're able to join us today as part of the UN Climate Change Conference and this resilient, Resilience Hub event supported by Asian Development Bank and the Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre. So to begin with, we have an exciting program for you today. We have a, three speakers um, who will speak to integrated water resource management generally and disaster preparedness. We'll focus on cities and the impact of climate change on cities and then the impact of climate change on food security in Asia. We will then have two pa a panel session uh, and two panelists will join us uh, for that as well to give us their reflections. So first of all, I'd like to just set the scene um, by talking about providing a bit of context and then we'll go to our speakers. So on this topic of integrated water resource management and climate change, it's a big topic. There's a lot to cover in this, but where did we start? Well, integrated water resource management concept has been around for 25 years. Many of you will be very familiar with it. It's globally recognized as a framework for collaborative and equitable water management. We would like to just have a look at how it's developed over time. So it has been in some cases conceptualized as an adaptive cycle of positive interventions. It deals with competing demands across society and the economy but aims to not compromise sustainability of vital ecosystems. So I think that this is where climate change is having the impact that we are seeing that ecosystems are reaching tipping points and being very negatively affected by an intensifying hydrological cycle. So where are we at with IWRM as a concept? Well, it's well integrated in, into SDG 6, uh, which is water and sanitation for all, but considering sustainability as well and water resource management. So it is it's mentioned in target 6.5, uh, which is about the implementation of integrated water resource management at all levels. And in 2020, we saw the progress update that only about 56% 56, 56 of countries in the regions are on track to meet this global target. And one challenge of IWRM is it's a process orientated goal, whereas other goals are a little bit easier to measure. So how can we conceptualize water security? Well, one way this is done is through the Asian Development Bank's Asian Water Development Outlook, which is a composite index containing five dimensions, rural household water security, urban water security, economic water security, and environmental water security. And then climate change comes into this fifth dimension, which is water related disaster security. So today we consider the three of those elements in more depth, urban water security, economic water security, which includes ag agricultural production, and then disaster, uh, water related disaster security. We focus in a bit more about understanding climate change impacts and building resilience. We see here a heat island diagram of cities. So we know temperatures are increasing in cities. Also, that means higher evapotranspiration. And also we see more and more intensification of severe events, droughts, floods, etc. What is climate resilience? Well, it's the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazard events, trends, and disturbances. So one of the big questions for today's session is. How can the IWR framework assist managers face current and escalating challenges? The biggest being climate change and rapid urbanisation and agricultural disturbance and growing inequality. Our speakers will provide a lot more depth onto those topics. So if I could introduce our first speaker is Mr. Hans Gutmann, who is Executive Director of the Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre in Thailand. You can see there all our speakers and panellists today and we'll introduce those as we go along. So over to you, Hans, thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me share my screen here. So welcome. And um, 
the topic in the IWRM in the context of climate change we'll starts out with what do we mean by that? It is clear that IWRM, as described earlier, is an established process for water management and has been very successful, although perhaps not universally applied. Um, climate change, however, is posing some new challenges to this approach, and we are to explore whether all is well or whether change and modification is needed. And uh, this is important because water is life and increasingly climate change is affecting water resources, coupled with the increased stress on available resources for food security and use in urban areas for wash and industrial use, etc. Water resources, it's sometimes too much, sometimes too little, or sometimes perfect. It is sometimes in the wrong place and it takes away, but also provides for. Often the focus is on the negative aspects, not enough or too much, but we need to address the issue and recognize how the important importance of it with this positive and indeed critical contribution that water provides to society. Until recently, uh, over the past 40, 50 years, maybe most water issues were given, taken as given, and the focus was on supply management to provide more access to water. However, water management, it does have a long history and there are recorded records of con conflicts of water act uh, water access that dates back um, four or 5,000 years. However, to address, as a previous speaker pointed out, the more complex issues around water management, the approach of IWRM has developed and evolved over the past 25 years or so. IWRM is now um, a very well-established concept and it already has a lot of tools and applications to support this process. And the definition by the Global Water Partnership is widely accepted. And the previous speaker linked the identified needs for IWRM to um, sustainable development goals and also the specifics relevant to Asia through the Asian Water Development Outlook. IWRM has several different components, um, but invariably one of the fundamental aspects is the water regime. Another is to involve different sectors, multi-sectorial is in the definition, and work on policies to guide water use, priorities to ensure equity, a basis for economic use and provisions for environmental flows, etc. And to manage all of this, governance is critical. And it's ideally inclusive and allows for meaningful multi stakeholder engagement. And finally, it's a process, not an end in itself. But today, I want to focus on one aspect that is being upended by climate change the water regime underpinning the scientific understanding of IWRM. Water is a renewable resource, and we have a good understanding on the water cycle and the specific water regimes, and water availability for good or for bad varies throughout the year, throughout the different seasons. A good example of the importance of the water regime is Ton Le Sap in, or the Great Lake in Cambodia, the system shown here in this slide. Uh, the Ton Le Sap shrinks during the dry season, and the light blue area indicates the size during that period, and expands in the wet season, the dark blue area. And the changes are dramatic. The inundated or flooded area are increased by 15 to 20 times to over 3,000 square kilometers. And usually about 80% of the lake's total volume is exchanged each year. During the dry season, the houses are high and dry. And during the wet season, they float. But the water regime is usually understood based on historical records, facts on water availability in the past, often in many places, quite long records. And this is used to understand how changes of the water will water use will affect future water regime and thus how it impacts the key elements of IWRM. But is this still valid? We know that the future is going to be different from the past with respect to hydrometeorological parameters. Climate change is driving this change. And there is also other changes due to environmental degradation and related issues such as groundwater subsidence, etc. The current standard in IWRM is to model future water uses, the future changes in water use based on the past water regime and water use. Can the past serve as a basis for the future under climate change? Evidence seems to point that it cannot. In addition, the climate science is informing us that most areas of in most areas, the frequency and intensity of extreme events are increasing. And um, does the current IWRM approach adequately account for the influence of these extreme events on what it has uh, in terms of impact on water use, water security, and consequent impacts on livelihoods? In short, if the new normal is more in severe frequent extreme events, is the current approach adequate? 
take 2021. In Central Europe was caught in devastating floods across many countries, including Germany, Belgium, France, and Netherlands. And I'm just raising this point because the Rhine River, which was effective, has one of the world's most advanced early warning system, yet people were taken by surprise and lives were lost. It, this was in part due to that the events were very extreme, but it was also many places governance that was failing and preparedness that was not there. Here in Asia, and floods are upending families and communities, obliterating infrastructure and crushed dreams of sustainable and prosper prosperous futures. Droughts are threatening livelihoods and may prompt further migration into cities. And the stress on water resources in urban areas are very obvious. Is there therefore a need to revisit IWRM to accommodate these changes? Will shifting the water regime basis from analysis of historical fact to a certain predictions provide a better basis or introduce unacceptable contested uncertainties. Can a change in water governance approach help in managing uncertainty? And do we need to revisit the principles of IWRM considering the new normal of climate change? The whole scope of IWRM is vast as indicated. So for these purposes, as indicated earlier also, this session we are looking on centering our discussion around two issues water and food security in the context of climate change and water and urban issues in the context of climate change. In addressing the urban water security, IWRM is equipped to deal with it or is it not equipped with it? And for food security, are we also talking about providing solutions in a changing climate? I'm eagerly looking forward to the discussions today and I hope that we will have more discussions following on after this particular session. And with this, I would like to yield the floor back to our other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hans Goodman. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Avi Sakai is joining us from uh, Laos. He's the Regional Advisor, Southeast Asia for Urban Basic Services for UN Habitats. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, you can hear me fine, right? Yes, thank you. Very clear. Yeah. Um, thank you once again. And I would like to thank ADPC and ADB for providing UN Habitat an opportunity to speak on the issue of the new dimension of water resilience in the urban sector. Um, my endeavor will be to try to build on what has just been presented uh, by Hans. While discussing about the scale of challenge, firstly, as we know that the world is becoming more and more urbanized, we are aware that 50% of the world's population is living in urban areas. And we often note that this has led to rapid and unplanned development, land subsidence and environmental degradation. These exacerbate urban vulnerability to the effects of climate change. Um, in addition, most of the biggest cities in the world are located in coastal areas in which there is a high risk of climate change impacts. And these impacts are affecting uh, all sectors and all activities. Secondly, we are also aware that water is a key driver of social and economic development, but disorganized urbanization is impacting water availability. And Sorry, water Avi. Just to interrupt briefly, do you mind using the presentation mode so the slides are a little larger for the audience, please? Uh, I am in the presentation mode. Oh, okay. I think maybe the, the slides are frozen. We can only see uh, non-presentation mode, but please continue. Sorry. So uh, as I was mentioning that uh, uh, we uh, water is a key driver of social and economic development, but uh, sort of disorganized urbanization is impacting water availability and quality uh, through overexploitation of water resources, uh, decreased water security, uh, increased vulnerability to floods and other natural disasters and uh, other water related health impacts. Uh, Sorry, the, Avi, I hate to interrupt you again, but do you mind trying without the video and then maybe the slides will move? I won't interrupt again after that, thank you. Uh, no worries. Uh, 
अभी आई थिंक यू टू रीशेयर Avi, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to reshare it. Oh, great! Thanks. Or, or, or uh, Sugar can share it. You just unshare your screen. Sugar will share the presentation. That's better. Otherwise, the flow will. Yeah, that would be better. I'm sorry. I have something. It, it has frozen at my end. Okay, Sorry. we can see Sugar's slides now. Uh, so please go ahead, Avi. We're on so, the we're on the title slide at the moment. So if we can go to the second slide, please. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, and we know that uh, due to the linkages to sort of diverse human activities, these water issues uh, cannot necessarily be managed in isolation. Next slide, please. So IWRM remains a key approach to water management, um, but the availability of water resources is uh, less predictable now. And human systems are increasingly getting more and more complex. And so we need a paradigm change. Uh, the exact impacts of climate change on local climate are highly uncertain. Uh, as is the availability of water resources. Moreover, issues like population growth or urbanization patterns uh, and changes in water demand are also extremely difficult to predict. There is therefore an urgent need to update IWRM approaches. So incorporating analytics on resilience and uncertainty into planning and investment design for water systems will bolster and also strengthen cities' capacity to survive, adapt, and uh, grow despite stresses and acute shocks. Uh, for cities, it is very important to build diversified and dynamic water resource portfolios and uh, make the most of available water sources through fit for purpose approaches uh, that consider the needs of each type of uh, water use. If you go to the next slide, please. So if we embrace water as a common good, we can advance responsible and equitable development. Planning for resilience uh, is an opportunity to manage trade-offs in water management. Urban water cycle elements such as water resources, water supply, sanitation, uh, storm water, uh, and waste uh, management uh, need to be integrated with the city's urban development and with river basin management. Um, and this is to be done to maximize economic, social, and environmental benefits in an equitable manner and to build resilience. Uh, important for us to note that the best practice builds consensus among stakeholders on priorities, explores the consequence of possible actions and uncertainties, and considers diverse aspects of a project's performance. So these practices involve planning and redesigning the urban landscape as an integral part of water basins, using integrated water resources management principles in managing cities of water resources. Next slide, please. Resilient uh, urban water management is an iterative long-term process, uh, sustained multi-sectoral coordination across urban, and water-related services together with participation in decision-making by all stakeholders uh, is required for improved urban and water service delivery. Uh, it's also very important to keep local governments at the center of the process. A key focus um, is to be on identifying vulnerabilities so as to inform the choice of suitable actions. We all understand that uh, cities need a robust uh, decision-making framework that increases resilience while they deal with also uncertainties, uh, particularly the changes in stresses that are being brought about by climate change. Many cities will need to build capacity to plan well, 
uh, identifying fit for purpose approaches requires a good understanding of the local context. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to quickly talk about our experience in Lao PDR. Um, where one of the issues faced locally was the lack of vulnerability mapping to inform local planning for water resilience in different settlements. Uh, vulnerability mapping uh, leads to a better understanding of how to prioritize beneficial actions. We all know that uh, Laos is an LDC, which is experiencing rapid urbanization, one of the fastest in Southeast Asia. There's a centralized governance system, but we have observed that subnational levels are becoming more and more involved in climate governance. Uh, UN Habitat, we partnered with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and developed a national climate risk and vulnerability assessment, which was aimed to identify the climate change related hazards such as floods, droughts, and storms, uh, and assessing the state of human settlements. To do this, what we have done is that we collected data from all the settlements in Laos using participatory data collection methods with results being uh, georeferenced by a GIS system for analysis. Uh, so what this methodology enabled us to do was to quickly obtain very reliable, up-to-date information to capture the main challenges which are being faced by the communities. So, in short, the objectives of the assessment were firstly to gain knowledge uh, of the climate vulnerability status to identify uh, climate change adaptation opportunities at the national, regional, and local levels. Secondly, it was also to respond to the need to develop better planning and investment strategies to mainstream climate change consideration, and at the same time to improve uh, risk management uh, including that of water management efforts. Uh, our effort uh, with Monre will enable the national and the subnational authorities in Laopedia to make informed uh, planning decisions to adapt to climate change and increase resilience. Uh, we have since received a number of requests from different development partners to make the data available for their programming efforts. Uh, next slide, please. And just to finally talk about a bit of the lessons learned is that community-based planning uh, can improve decision-making processes to better respond to climate change challenges. So the involvement of local stakeholders and communities has played a critical role in developing provincial and district vulnerability profiles in Laopedia. What we have seen that uh, local stakeholders for our projects uh, not only always plays an important role in finalizing the vulnerability profiles, but also plays an important role uh, in developing the action plans and finally in actual implementation uh, of the projects. Currently in Laos, we are working in over 200 settlements, uh, small and big, to address these IWRM issues. So we are working in settlements which are as small as say for 300 residents and we are working in settlements or cities as big as 40,000 people. Um, so the entire gamut. Uh, and the second uh, lessons learned is developing vulnerability assessments and making data sets accessible and available can support multi-sectoral project development and strengthen integrated water resource management. As I mentioned earlier that uh, many of the developed partners are reaching out and we are cooperating and collaborating with them on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avi. Uh, that was fascinating to hear uh, about this, the massive data collection exercise you have been through there um, and wonderful to, we're look, I'm looking forward to asking more questions about that during the Q&A session. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Dr. Fong Nguyen, who's the Deputy Director General from the Vietnam Academy of Water Resources. Uh, um, we're looking forward to him speaking about uh, climate change impacts on food security and irrigation. Thank you.
And Dr. Fong, feel, please feel free to now share your screen as well and slides. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank ADB and ADPC to give me a chance to talk a little bit about the um, adaptation measures for the food securities and also for the agriculture. Um, okay. okay, can you see that? Uh, yes, we can see that. Uh, maybe try presentation mode. Thank you. Okay. So first, uh, so my presentation is including uh, five uh, contents. Uh, first is uh, some figures on the Vietnamese war resources. Second one is challenge of the war security and food security. The third one is war resilience and IWM. And the fourth one, some thought from Vietnam experience. And the fifth one is some proposed solution or some measures from the practical uh, experiences. So I would like to start with the, some figures on Vietnam war resources. And you will see that most of the real basic in Vietnam will experience different levels of the stress by using the water exploitation index in the, uh, so you would, see, you would see that all the river basin would be uh, scared of, of waters in the futures. And the second one is the, the water use of agriculture's Account. Sorry, to, sorry, I need to interrupt, Dr. Fong. I'm, I'm sorry, with the slides are not progressing in what we can see. Are, are you moving ahead? You could not see the presentation? There, I can see, but it's not changing slides. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fong, if it's okay, ADB will share the slides. You can tell next, next, next. Okay. Now you see that? Now you see that? No, it's not moving. still the same. No, so maybe um, we can request a, if you stop sharing, we can request ADB. To oh, share. now, no, no, now, now it's moving. Yeah, now it's moving. Okay, I use it. I think it's better. Huh? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, uh, okay, so were used for agriculture at a proposed cost for more than 80% of total nation waters. And the third one is a world of productivity is quite low in Vietnam. So that only uh, around um, 2.37 uh, US dollars. That's uh, the GDP created from the one square, one cubic meters uh, of the world. And, and talking about the challenge of water security, that um, and food security. So only uh, thirty-seven percent of water resources originated inside of the Vietnam country. So sixty-three percent from the outside. So meanwhile, the hydropower development in Mekong River or Red River was affected the water flow in Vietnam. Second one is the the, uh, the activity in the in the upstream. So also uh, generated negative impact. To the, to the downstream is the pollution, sediment deficit, ecosystem degradation. And the third one, as Han also mentioned, and so my colleagues also mentioned about climate change increase, is the extreme even and so and uncertainty. It also creating more sub natural disaster even. So historic drought appear. Sanitation in, in the Comenta is increasing in recently years. It's, and also more urban inundation event, river bank and coastal line erosion is happening more and more seriously. So lacking this effective mechanism to foster strand boundary cooperation by sharing the data, sharing the information in the country, in the, in the basins. The second one is the water pollution also uh, create very negative impact to the agriculture production. And the high non-revenue water losses in the urban and rural water supply is also increasing. And the fourth one is under new circumstances with increasing uncertainty, the historic characteristic of the Mekong Delta, especially and another river basin is greatly under in the negative trend. No decreased frequency of the flood in the Mekong River come to the downstream. The increasing sunicity in children, so that affected agriculture production, mostly on the coastal areas of the countries. 
So the reducing of sediment in, in the downstream affect the actual production as well. The land loses every year for the sea level rise and also the exploitation of the groundwater for the uh, for aquaculture also uh, create very negative impact to the agriculture production. And the world related disaster risk is increasing with climate uncertainty and social economic development. So talking about a little bit about the world resilience and IWIM. So Han also mentioned a lot of questions about the IWIM and how we can change the approach or how we can change thinking to do the IWIM for the, for the food security or the, for the agricultural production. So let's see a three dimension of the revision is the persistencies, adaptability, transport abilities. Meanwhile, the three principles, I think that Han also mentioned very clear in his presentation, that such is a social equity, economic efficiency, it's ecological sustainability. So I don't want to go more deeply about this, but just remind you a little bit about the linkage as a connection between three dimensions of resilience and the three principles of IWRM. So some thoughts uh, from Vietnam experiences. So that, that for sure, that agriculture production in Vietnam is highly vulnerable to the war resources, uncertainty, and quantity and, and quality. And the upstream development impact from the, the upstream also create a lot of the negative impact for the downstream. And our WRI encourage transboundary collaboration mechanisms. And climate change is getting worse. Maybe getting better in the future, no one knows. So it's creating a lot of the worry related disaster to the agricultural uh, production. So it so requires IWIM framework need to be changed or need, need to be having another approach. The water efficiency or water productivities also need to be increased in the agriculture production. So water resilience is really now is the most interest of our government. So the National Assembly that approved the National Pro uh, Water Security Program. So it's also created a lot of measures, adopt adaptation measures for the agriculture production and so food security. And also um, the re resilient dimension, we have to be a character and categorize and index for easy evaluation for the different countries. Now, I come up with some proposed adaptation measure from a, a practical experience. So changing IWM approach, maybe a solution of the measures to adapt uncertainty of climate change and food security. So we look at the nexus, the work of the nexus of water security, food security, and ecosystem security. Now affecting by a lot of the water-related disaster, drought, salinity intrusion, flood, pollution, and also water efficiency, or to use efficiency world productivity in agriculture. And in the meantime, we need also a lot of the technologies for monitoring, for planning, and so for management. They're using the different technologies, like a digital transformation in terms of the agricultural production, in terms of the disaster uh, uh, warning or uh, forecasting. So, Optimizing water for agriculture. So look at the restructuring agriculture sectors by using the plant variety to the value chain orientation. Suitable to water resources availability in the each region. So how much water you can need, we can have in the future. So it's needed very uh, serious need for the uh, for forecasting and 
water accounting, and also diversify and higher value agriculture for more efficiency, but to use less water. So it's also very important solution and measures in, in our countries, in, especially in Mekong Delta. So we can also find the solution for the smart farming, ecological farming, agriculture of classmates climate smart agriculture practices and saving water irrigation technologies. The second one is the enhanced water resources monitoring and measurement and data availability. So optimizing water resources managing by using good data and data availability on supply and demand and quality and benefit and cost among other things. So water should be managed and considered as economic input to the production agriculture production and is a value accounted. So data based a decision support system for IWRM, water accounting, water accumulation with support by the technology expression of GS and efficient intelligence and so on to improve the quality and accuracy of water early warning system for water related disaster and also preparedness and respond actions. So improve the world productivity and so very important adaptation measures, especially in the agricultural production. So ensures adequate storage attribution mechanism. It should be done while promoting the integrated water resources management and investing in climate adaptation and resilience. So in the, our national world security program, so the measures also shown that in storage, including through wetland and nature based solutions necessary to mitigate the flood and drought risk, an unintegrated approach to it to, to manage this system. So, forming a national water sources network, proactively regulating and allocating water to the key re reasons to so bearing the water storage infrastructure serving multi purposes. Work to control sour water and fresh water and estuary and water diversification solution in the basin, connection and link the water resources within the basin and the different basins. So policies and institutional arrangement also must account for the integrated nature of water resources management. So transboundary issues need to be also improved by sharing information and effective cooperation activities and program to promote integrated part risk management, drought management, including piloting a nature-based solution. So it should be integrated to the land use planning and early warning system, a cost-effective investment to the agriculture sectors. So that is some uh, um, uh, proposed adaptation measures for the practice from the, our practice experiences for the agriculture production and also the food security. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Fong. There was, um, it covered a lot of ground in that presentation and I think our audience um, will have some, probably some questions for you. We, I think we do have time for a couple of clarifying questions before we move to the panel session. Uh, we did receive one um, for RV. Um, wondering, RV, if you could answer that question. You put it in the chat, but maybe if you could speak to that a little bit about all of that um, extensive data that you said that you collected from those um, thousands of settlements. Did you have that data disaggregated, disaggregated by sex, age, and disability? Yeah. Uh... Thank you, Bronwyn. So yes, uh, as, I, as I replied that we have uh, some of the data sets on detailed data sets on community profile, um, definitely on the population disaggregated by sex, but unfortunately, we do not, uh, we hadn't collected on the disability. But what I would take this opportunity to quickly mention is that this was a big exercise, all settlements in Laos, urban and rural. Uh, 7.2 million sort of spread in this 8,500 settlements. 
Um, in a development parlance, probably it would be a big project with a million, at least a million dollar budget. But we actually did this project with a zero budget availability because it was a national assembly request from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and who then in turn requested UN Habitat. Of course, we had staff who were available to do that work, but I think it also talks of the great leadership when you are interested, the minister really pushed for it, used all the provincial and the district offices available to uh, collect the data from the settlements. So the whole exercise was done in three months time, which I think is amazing considering that there are so many challenges that could come across. So the original National Assembly request was for eight provinces, but then we thought that if we are to do, why don't we do for the all 18 provinces? So now we have a great data set uh, available in Laos, uh, which can be used for a number of uh, uh, work that uh, different development agencies are currently engaged in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Avi. I mean, that's amazing um, rapidity of a project at that scale and a great example of it being embedded in the government systems and uh, replicable. Uh, so thank you for that um, further information. Now, we also did have a question for um, Dr. Fong. It's just, it's quite a broad one, but perhaps you could just point out, the question is to do with why Vietnam's water resources are insecure or not as secure as uh, previously? And if you could just highlight what you would see as the key issues, because obviously there would be many. Okay, uh, so actually, um, I think that um, um, we uh, just uh, prepare, I also the member of the group to prepare the national water security program. So that would be a very, uh, um, a lot of reason why Vietnam is insecure in war resources. So I mentioned at the beginning that more than 60% uh, the war resources come from the outside. So only 30%, the 37% from the inside, uh, come from the inside of Vietnam. The second one is uh, we are really affected by the, by the, um, by the um, uh, with, um, disaster related, with war related disaster. So more and more uh, uncertainty and more and more extreme by the, um, by the climate change, by the climate change impact. The, the third one is the, um, the the third one is a, also the groundwater so affected by the exploit exploring the the groundwater for the agriculture uh, for the uh, also aquacultures so it's, it's also very 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 serious impact the the fourth one is the the irrigation system and also the the little ones dam is decreasing. So the efficiencies of the irrigation uh, system and, and quite low. So we need a lot of effort to, 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 um, to improve, improve the, the, the uh, irrigation system. And the fifth one is also important is a participation of the water user groups to, to uh, help to, to, to reduce the water losses in the urban and the rural areas. So a lot of, and also the, the, the next thing, also the, the recreation of the, the price quality. So it's really impact to the, uh, to the, the, the world resources inside of Vietnam. And the next reason also could be, uh, could be important reasons is uh, the sharing of the world, different the, the basin, different region. So a lot of, 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 of things to be shared. So you can contact me directly. Yeah. Then you can uh, you can talk more about this. Thank you, Dr. Fong. That was a comprehensive answer, and as I've guessed, many many reasons for lack of security in water. Yeah. Um, so now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our panelists. Panelists, if you could please turn your cameras on, and also speakers, if you could have your cameras on, that would be fantastic. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sharon Taylor. So Sharon Taylor is working for the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement, which is a local NGO implementing the program with Oxfam called Building Resilient Urban Communities in Asia, and um, is joining us, I think, from the Philippines, of course. And also we have Dr. Sutat Wesakul, who is from the who is the director, sorry, of 
the Hydroinformatics Institute in Thailand. So thank you both for joining us. I might just start with uh, you, Sharon, and your thoughts and impressions and from those presentations and how they relate to your urban resilience program. Yeah, um, thank you, Roman. And thank you to all the speakers for very comprehensive outlines of the issues with um, IWRM as it relates to the supply, the distribution and the um, impact on food security that that presents as well. That was very comprehensive. In terms of the key lessons in terms of how does it relate to urban resilience projects that I've been involved with here in the Philippines. Yeah, it's in sync completely. Um, other issues we need to look at, and we've looked at in terms of just calculating what is the existing supply and demand that has to be brought into any IWRM framework is yes, you've got the population increase, but you've also got to look at the daily changes between nighttime, daytime, as workers come into urban areas, applying demand for water as well. Um, I think in terms of how urbanization is impacting on the uptake of IWRM, and especially in the context of climate change, climate related disasters, the hydrometeorological impacts. Um, I think we need to address the existing challenges with the uptake first in terms of governance. Um, especially in the Philippines, and I know in other countries, different government agencies have different responsibilities when it comes to water management, whether it's um, supply, distribution, planning, etc. Um, we need to bring into that system the agencies involved in um, the forecasting, the climate change scenarios, the flood monitoring and forecasting, Climate Change Commission, all of these need to be able to coordinate, collaborate for the equitable um, management, IWRM. Private sector is also involved heavily here in the Philippines in terms of distribution, in terms of treatment and filtration of water resources. One thing that is lacking and that was highlighted by um, Avi's presentation is the community focus. So that was very good to see the community assessments that were done, which we went on in our communities as well, to look at a gender responsive, socially inclusive elements to IWRM. So working through vulnerability and adaptation assessments, bringing in the climate change scenarios and how they impact on the challenges already felt when it comes to water supply and usage. Um, for residential use, commercial use, food security, all those factors. And then basically that can be brought in to update the IWRM systems in place. So basically address existing challenges, bring in the community voice into the list of stakeholders responsible for the implementation of IWRM, bring in the climate change scenarios, um, and looking at the impact assessment matrices when it comes to climate change scenarios and improving the governance um, in terms of urban planning, which I think was brought in by the last presenter as well to address the competing needs for the water resource. We also have to look at how do we sustain the water source as well in an urban environment, or are we reliant on um, looking at the river basin management as a whole, which I think was also brought up by um, Avi as well in his presentation. So it's very, very complex when you get into the urban setting. It's complex in a rural setting, how much more so with the challenges of urbanization and then climate change on top of that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those insights, Sharon, all excellent points and as you say very complicated. Now if we could uh, go to you Dr Sutat and, and your reaction or of views and responses to the presentations and what you think hydroinformatics can bring to the table. I think they have a presentation, they have a good presentation but I would like to add the system that if you have the climate change it deal with uncertainty and vulnerability. Therefore, the present IWRM do not have 
include this uh, directly. Therefore, I would like to propose that if you have the robustness system linked to the IWIN, so that you can test the solution before implement, you can test uh, the variability of the climate. And then the uh, robust system will show the degree of resilience. The robust system will show some of the possible solutions, which can link to multi, uh, multi criteria and the multi uh, function of, of the IWIN. So that uh, that will complete the system. That is for for my uh, comment. Listen to the speaker, which they they have implied already. But I would like to wrap wrap up into the the system and put on the top of the existing IWIs. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Professor Wang. Um, I mean, we are dealing with quite big systems, obviously the agricultural system, we've seen the detail um, issues arising there in Vietnam. And of course, also in, um, in Laos, the extensive and data collection around um, urban issues. I wonder if we could go to the panel and just ask the question, I mean, how do you see IWRM in this space? Is it still fit for purpose kind of framework? Um, You've just raised, Dr. Sutat, that it, it doesn't have the robustness. It doesn't have that ability to test uncertainty and, un, you know, kind of beyond what has it been experienced in the um, historical record. What? How can we adapt IWM? Do we think it's the right framework to move us forward? Um, maybe I'll start with uh, you, Hans. Sure, thank you. Um, I think I can only echo what Sutat was touching upon in terms of working on um, tweaking the system perhaps, but also looking at some of the fundamentals in order to be able to deal with the directional change uh, predicted by climate change, but, but perhaps more importantly, the uncertainties that are introduced as I touched upon historical facts that we are tend to use now or prediction based on global models, etc., and downscaling. So how, how to be able to deal with that without uh, ending up with uh, so much uncertainty that it's difficult to, for people to, to, to have faith in it and apply it. At the same time, I think uh, what Sharon was raising in terms of, yes, there's a lot of complexity, but um, there is also a lot of opportunity by more effectively and effect efficiently, perhaps, engage a number of stakeholders and get them closer together, so to say, the, if this, the sort of science behind it can work closely, more closely with the users as such, then perhaps there's better understanding on what the uncertainties and variabilities um, imply in terms of adaptiveness, etc. So the, the, I think there's a lot of work. There, there is, uh, in my view, a need to revisit Parts of it. It doesn't mean that we throw everything out with a bath, maybe with a bathwater, so to say, but certainly looking into some of the key elements that may not be as uh, relevant or accurate any longer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I guess I'd be interested to go to our urban colleagues, Avi and Sharon, and, and ask Have you included IWM as part of your program? Is it something that is embedded in what you're doing, or is this something that would be applied over the top? I'm interested to see how much it actually comes up in the programs you're implementing. Maybe we'll start with Avi. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, yeah, IWRM is sort of a bread and butter of uh, a UN habitat, at least in Laos, because we have uh, big uh, water programs uh, in the country. Uh, we have an investment, uh, of course, compared to some of the IFIs, it is not that big, but uh, we have more than a $12 million of uh, program related to water currently being implemented in Laos. So this is, this is a big uh, part of a portfolio in the country. And as I mentioned, we are trying to deal with it through active uh, st uh, stakeholder involvement at the community level. We are trying to find out solutions, bringing in tools and methodologies which can sort of uh, integrate uh, sort of climate change science uh, into the local planning and, and also trying to see that how we have these tools 
uh, also in a way that it is easily understood uh, and people can uh, work with it easily. So we, we are doing a lot of this sort of integrating climate change into our day-to-day -day water uh, projects that we deliver in this country. Yes, in that way, we are very much into it. Thank you. Yeah, so it sounds like, as you say, it's kind of embedded in the way you work, but you're adding more tools to it. Uh, Sharon, your response? Yes, um, in three of our project areas in the Philippines, water was prioritized by the community as the major resilience issue they were facing. Um, in La Trinidad up north, it was basically due to flood events. Um, there was box culverts divine in an agricultural area, but they weren't keeping up with the rainfall events that were happening. So basically we looked at the historical events in the past and how the duration of the flood events did that whole analysis with the communities and then brought in the climate change scenarios, worked with them with the community. expanded to enhance flow, outflow. So we were looking at how can we make sure that the underserved population that didn't have access to water could get access to water using the normal water supply systems, but also looking at integrating systems, NBS systems, tree planting for um, preserving the water aquifer replenishment, um, looking at rainwater harvesting systems and integrating that into a comprehensive mix as well. And then the, the fourth area, we were looking at um, disasters from rain-induced landslides. So looking at slope protection, riverbank um, systems and management, both upstream and downstream of the affected community. So yes, very much so it's, IWRM is critical to resilience of the stakeholders. And I agree, I think the system in place works to a certain extent but when we're looking at urbanization and climate change, it does need to be brought up to the current context and challenges. And as Hans quite point, rightly pointed out, all the opportunities that presents as well from the wealth of knowledge we have already. So thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I wondered, uh, Dr. Sutat, if you had any thoughts on how easy or difficult it is to create new tools that really will help us with the forecasting that needs to happen at, at various scales uh, to enable the kind of planning through the uncertainty ahead. And uh, we saw some, we just got lots of very nice local examples from Sharon of what that actually means for local people. Yes, uh, for the forecasting, for the climate first, it is multi-scale from daily to weekly to monthly to sub-seasonal to annual and to the long terms. There is a multi-scale multi for the forecasting with different technique and with different uncertainty and variability also. But therefore you need to test your systems with the field measurement to be sure that that is the good forecasting. You need to test it. And of course, very really long-term forecasting is difficult to, to test it. Therefore, you need to involve in the accepted and uncertainty. So in order for the long-term of the modeling, you need to do multi-criteria analysis and focus on the subject that you use. For example, if you focus on the uh, heavy rainfall in the urban area for the DRR. So you focus on the uh, rainfall, not in the, uh, the drought or in the water period. You focus specifically on the subject that you focus. If you're working on the food security, you worry about the drought, then you, in, you, you concentrate on the monsoon onset and the length of the monsoon. So it, there are different different parameters to forecast. Therefore, it will imply that which model should be suitable. If there are many models, you, you rank in it, you rank it, and then you, you, you can take an ensemble 
from those selected models. So I think this is the, the good me method to select with listenable and it can be put into, into IWIM to have a bigger scenario for the operation and the planning and the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sutat. I am, I've noticed that there, we have a question that takes us back towards food security in the chat, which is a question about um, well, the effect of climate change in terms of how consumptive use estimates. So similar issue that we're dealing, we're trying to derive models from historical record, um, but those evapotranspiration, et cetera, has changed so much. So the question is maybe best directed to Dr. Fong, how do irrigators change irrigation scheduling and volume determinations? And are there new modules or mod manuals or guidelines that can help with this? So I guess in the agriculture and irrigation sector, um, have new models okay. got to the point of being implemented in this way? Okay, so I, I sorry, I opened my camera. I don't know why, but okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, so uh, I think very good question because it's really necessary to to uh, to calculate the irrigations consumption um, um, consumption uh, for the um, for the agriculture production. Um, actually, we also develop some some seed and some uh, variety that need less water consumption and also um, can uh, can use uh, for the uh, salinity insulin so it's uh, uh, it's really necessary to to calculate the water consumption in the irrigation schedule and uh, of course it's so necessary also to have a new manual on guidelines for the irrigators and the, if in vietnam we have the irrigation management company who will who will manage uh, uh, water uh, for irrigation. So um, um, the some manual and, and some uh, guideline also need to prepare. Of, of course, it need also need to need it need to 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 fit to to fit to the uh, to the, the seed and the variety uh, of the paddy rice, for example. And the second ones in the for the highland, for example, we have the we plant the coffee and pepper, for example. So more and um, irrigation, saving irrigation technologies be applied to reduce water consumption. Of course, we also have already manual and guideline for the irrigation for the, for the high valley crops and also in the highland crops. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fong. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear about the kind of water efficiencies and water saving um, mechanisms that are beginning or increasingly being needed to be put into place. I think I might just open it to the um, panel. Do you have a question of each other at this point? <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a rare collection of experts here. We might as well uh, open, the, open the floor a little. I know, Hans, you had so many questions. Yes, you got your hand up, good. Yes, if I may, perhaps, and direct to Avi, I think uh, your presentation and example of, of having uh, going ahead with a sort of nationwide comprehensive uh, assessment, um, do you see that as a repl replicable approach? Not saying that you should do all of India in one month or anything like that, but um, of taking this bigger uh, picture, because with that amount of data also, some of the difficulties in statistics and aggregation are, are reduced because the, the sample size uh, increases. So just your reflection on that in this context. Um, thank you, Hans. Uh, I mean, Hans himself is such an experienced person. I think he knows the answer to this. <laughs> I mean, Laos is, a, Laos is, of course, a very um, interesting case. And also the 7.2 million people, it's, it's just a very small, country we are talking about. And there's a lot of homogeneity. Uh, of course, there is diversity, but there's a lot of homogeneity. And, and there is also the system of governance also helped in the system on the data collection. 
So there are many advantages of collecting data in that way in Laos. But of course, what is very important that we found out, and as, which I mentioned briefly earlier, is the leadership. Also the interest of the minister himself to drive that agenda and to collect that data, and also the interest of the National Assembly. I think all these different factors sort of spurred the data collection. And we also kept the, uh, the design of the data collection as simple as possible so that uh, the enumerators who are doing the legwork at the field level could collect it. And it was not a sampling exercise. It was, it ended up being a census. You know, it, it was like we collected data from each and every village uh, regarding these vulnerabilities. Um, in a different country, in a different context, I think uh, it, 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 you're very right, Hans. I mean, possibly in a country like India, I mean, can we do this sort of an exercise? I, I mean, perhaps we have to end up doing a bit of a sampling, right? Um, but from our experience, we have never done in any other country. This was the first time we were thrown a challenge and we did it and, and thankfully it worked well. But what we are planning to do is that uh, since we also liked what we have done, we envisage that we will continue this exercise over the next two, three years so that we have a sort of an annual check and, and see where, what is the sort of the dynamic movement, if any. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Avi. I guess I'd just jump in. I mean, it was interesting. You've done this massive vulnerability assessment, and clearly that's the um, community's priorities. You, you said you collected a lot of data on what they see as their priorities and challenges. And I, I guess that links a little bit to what Sharon was talking about as well and community-led solutions. So perhaps first to you, Sharon, how do you see the kind of models that Dr. Sutad is talking about uh, meeting somewhere in the middle with community-led solutions. So how, how do you see these two realms um, coming together positively? Yeah, we did have one direct example of that in one of our project areas where our participatory approach to um, guiding the communities in identifying their priority issues and developing solutions, integrating the nature-based solutions into those was actually taken up by the local government unit as they saw the um, the importance of the community voice in the planning and budgeting processes. So they integrated some of the tools and methodologies that they've been a participant to in our series of workshops and data gathering into their own planning methodologies as well. So there is scope. Yep, yeah, that, that's, I admit, that's just one example, but it gives hope. There is scope, there is scope. And even the marriage between the scientific climate change data and the community's indigenous knowledge of events in their areas can be married perfectly as well. Um, it all depends on the facilitation and the guidance given during these processes and to show that yes, it can be done and to try and um, maximize the opportunities for where that can be done as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And then, um... Yeah, really interesting example. And then Avi, I guess I'm wondering with all of those, the vulnerability data that you have now, what, what will be put in place to support communities develop their own local resilience strategies? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. And, and actually we're working on it. Uh, we are currently working in 200 uh, sort of settlements in Laos, uh, as I mentioned, big and small. And, and so we are working in some of the biggest cities in central Laos in the Southern Akhet province where the city is about 40,000 people, uh, Saiputhan. So we're working in those sort of cities in that, mag at that scale. And then we are also working in very smaller cities, uh, smaller communities. So what we're doing is that building on this vulnerability assessment, we are uh, engaging with the local stakeholders in, def in defining uh, what we call action plans and, and sort of coming up with a set of menu of interventions that possibly could enhance the resilience of those communities. And then we are picking up from those sort of uh, actions identified on those action plans, we're picking up one or two, and then we are carrying out some small level infrastructure uh, at the community level. But what is happening in this process is that it's empowering the communities, their understanding, and also they also now have a menu of sort of uh, in, of sort of interventions, they can ask for if some other development partner comes in into that sort of uh, community to engage in. And then just to add on to what Sharon was mentioning, um, I mean, we had some very interesting experience in Laos that after all this 
different data and analysis and all what we found. And when we went back to the communities, we found that their indigenous knowledge and they're so good at it that they basically said whatever we had to do with so much of analysis. They said, yes, it is getting a bit warmer. Yes, uh, rainfall is more intense. And they knew everything. I mean, so I think it was a um, good experience for us that we need to so much learn from the local communities as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you've all raised such interesting points and I think um, mentioning the local knowledge and Indigenous knowledge, meeting scientific knowledge halfway, um, that it all can contribute to a resilient future. It, it's been an absolute pleasure to, hearing from you all, talking with you all today. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Hans Goodman, who is going to give us some concluding remarks and close the session. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And uh, let me just uh, jump in here. I mean, uh, if we go back and look at the beginning, apart from my own presentation, there was some urban key issues put forward. Uh, there was this nationwide approach uh, presented for Lao PDR and, and how the community days planning can be improved um, in decision making processes uh, to respond by having this vulnerability information. Now, we then also touched on food security and agriculture. And I mean, as pointed out there, it's the biggest water user in many countries, and thus it's vulnerable to change in hydrology. And from there on, there are many challenges uh, and many opportunities and listed water and efficiencies, nature-based solutions, et cetera, et cetera. But if we look at the, some key messages perhaps here, I think um, what was clear is that resilient urban water management is an iterative and long-term process and the unpredictable population growth and urbanization patterns add to the uncertainty in water demand, et cetera, and exacerbated by climate change. So these uncertainties, they are uh, compounded and uh, thus the cities should incorporate analytics on vulnerability and uh, resilience and uncertainty in water system planning. And at a conclusion, it's very complex, but not insurmountable. Another point is that IWRM approaches needs to be incorporated uh, by, or needs to incorporate futures uh, and extreme events and other things that may become more normal than now. But the approach, um, we'll, we will need to revisit it, not just from a climate change perspective, but also the changing roles of actors, whether it's regional or local level, and the governance. And I think that was put forward in the governance in building water resilient and achieving water security for the future. So there are some examples where I'm strengthening the link between the, let's call it the users, the people or water users as such, and, and the groups that are providing information as a basis. And we refer to forecasting or, other types of predictions. It's also clear that uh, there's advantages of bringing communities even further into the process and being closely involved, addressing inclusion. I think again there from the Philippines, we had some good examples on how engaging communities help dealing with some of the uncertainty. Um, I mean, in, in some there, IDA, IWRM, I think was said it, it works, but it needs some refinement and upgrading. And I think that is a take home message. Um, and there, also, the recent lessons from extreme events globally calls for better practices um, and being able to work on applying this in an uncertain environment. Now, um, we are clear that uh, this is not only for building water resilience, but also national water security. And, and as the world, as Asia, is recovering from social and economic setbacks by COVID-19 and adapting to climate change, this pushes water security high on many countries' agenda, and therefore uh, learning from these approaches is important. Water security, after all, enables social and economic development and conditions for a healthy and prosperous society. So to conclude, IWRM is a key component of resilience building, in, including in urban areas where we have many people, and for food security, which uh, is the greatest user of water but it needs to be further developed to better handle uncertainty, consider the scale of information collected and the approach available and the significance of extreme events and the complexity due to other interactions, as well as enhancing the governance and reach into communities more effectively. Leadership 
was touched upon and is perhaps in many cases more important than the resources available for undertaking this data collection or other functions. And then we had example from Lao PDR there. And also our experience in the Philippines, there was opportunities to let the communities lead in the resilience building. So with that, uh, I would like to thank all of the presenters and, and panelists and, and Bronwyn for your moderating and all others who have supported this uh, webinar from ADPC and ADB and others. Uh, from ADPC side, we look forward to take these discussions forward as IWRM is, is a key in building climate resilience, which in turn is a key priority for ADPC in Asia and the Pacific. So with that, I would like to thank you all and for all of you participated for your questions and hopefully we have the opportunity to follow through on some of these issues and maybe we can meet in person in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.